Hey, this is Horner, and this is the 2013 AP Physics C Mechanics free response question number one. Uh, and essentially what you have here is just a, a glider that a student has placed onto, a, um, onto an air track. So there's no friction at all uh, anywhere along the track. The only friction that you would get would just be here in the spring. And they push the glider back. It compresses the spring so that it starts at the zero point and then it takes off. And some things that I want you to notice here is there's no friction, okay? So no friction, which means that when it is moving at this point, so at the point two five meters, as it moves this way, its speed is constant. So if we did a motion diagram, speed would be constant here. Uh, however, at and our acceleration would be zero all the way across. Um, but up to that point, so from here, so from where it is here over to here, its velocity and acceleration, uh, its velocity increases as it goes until it gets to this point and it becomes normal, and our acceleration is the same until it hits this point and it becomes zero. So definitely accelerating just for this little bitty, little bitty uh, time. And then uh, once the glider hits this point and the spring no longer is attached, then it just goes at a constant speed until it hits the bumper. Uh, so with all that great information, let's go ahead and look and see what they actually want us to do. And the first thing they want us to do is to use this data and plot the data on a graph. So let's go ahead and take a look at the graph that they have here. And it says on the axis below, they want us to plot the data points for the velocity. So that funny looking U should really be a V as a function of time. Be sure to label an appropriate scale. So when you look at your data, you're gonna notice that um, this data for the side that we want uh, We've got velocity going along the uh, y-axis, and our velocity only goes up to about 0.51. So we know that we can start at zero and then go up to and include 0.5, probably need a little bit higher than that, so we should be set. Um, at this point, we're gonna put 0.25 here, we're gonna put 0.51 here, and uh, we won't do any more with it. Uh, the other thing that we need to do here is go ahead and plot all our points. First point that you plot should occur somewhere about right here. Your second point should be somewhere around right here. Your third point should be about here. Your fourth point, your fifth point's a little bit below, but your sixth point is right above. So when you draw this curve, you get kind of an interesting curve that comes up. It hits that first dot, it keeps sloping, hits that dot gets here, and then when it gets here, it essentially is flat. Um, and so that means that your velocity is, is just basically the same. So we said that this is time, be careful, this is not position, not position. So we're gonna have to figure out kind of what's going on with this thing. It's moving, it's accelerating, its speed is getting greater until it hits about, no, just before one second. So probably just in this area here, its velocity becomes very, very constant as it moves left or right. Uh, so it's always trying to find more and more positions. So the student w wishes to use the data to plot a position as a function of time graph for the glider. So we're gonna go from this to this, x versus t. And to do that, remember if you were to draw a uh, just a, a tangent line anywhere along the curve, you are not gonna get position. Instead, we're gonna get velocity over time, and that's acceleration. So we don't wanna do this, no, no, no. We instead want to look at uh, the equation velocity is equal to displacement over time, and um, if we want to uh, plot that, uh, we want to know the displacement, that's going to be equal to velocity times time. So if I multiply the two together, really what I'm doing for each one of these positions is I'm finding the area under the curve, okay? And as you go, you're gonna get more and more area because that thing will continue to move further and further. But you could pick any, any sort of area that you want to. So we could do it between these two points um, in order to make that next graph. So how do we kind of explain that? Well, we need to say that we're going to plot, so I'm gonna get rid of this. We really need to just kind of explicitly say what we're going to do, and that is plot uh, position versus time 
okay? And to do that, we need to uh, find the area under the V versus time curve. So in calculus, what we would say is the position can be found by taking the integral of the velocity uh, versus the change in position, the change in time. Uh, the slope uh, of, so if I want to find uh, the slope of x as a function of time would use, would give us that velocity. So here, um, and maybe I better explain that, so if I did position versus time, if I have a curve, okay, and my curve's going to start looking like this and it's going to smooth out, uh, the slope of this is going to give us our velocity. So where our velocity is straight, we're not going to have that anymore. So let's go ahead and take a look at what that curve should look like. They want us to plot it. And we know that the velocity is pretty straight when we are somewhere in this area here. So what we'll do is let's just go ahead and make a straight line right here. And then we've got to, in our mind, kind of think about a curve that would come up and meet that. So that curve that would meet it would be something that maybe would look like this, not much of a curve. So let's just redo this straight line again. If it doesn't work out, make it a little bit steeper. That makes it a lot easier to come up and meet. So now we've got a little bit better. This is probably a better curve. We can see the upward slope or the concave up. And then right at one, it kind of moves up uh, and to the right a little bit. Uh, some people might say that that's not really going to be good enough because it's going to run into the words up here. So if you really wanted to, you could do like this and then have it come up and then kind of slope off like that. Uh, it looks a little bit discontinuous, but that probably would be more than OK on this one. The next thing they want us to do is they want us to calculate the time. So here they want us to calculate the time that um, it would take uh, for that uh, car to get all the way over to the bumper. So the best thing I think to do on this one, there's a way that you could approximate the squares. So if you wanted to, we could go back up to this graph. Uh, you could replot it if you wanted to. So you'd end up something like this. You could see how many squares there are. There's almost three full squares here. And then you could approximate about how much uh, time it takes to do all it's just not a really good method of doing it there's a lot easier method to do this so the easier method to do it is to think about when that spring is compressed it is compressed but the glider sticking out to 0.25 so we know that from 0 to about 0.25 is our first amount of time um, and it takes we said about 0.79 seconds for it to go from 0 to 0.25. So think about that. It says at time is equal to 0.79, the glider loses contact. So right here we have 0.79 seconds. If that's true, our first distance is 0.25 meters. Okay, so that's D1. Our second distance is going to be equal to 2 minus 0.25 meters. So here's our 2, here's our 0.25. So the glider at first accelerates here and then it just moves at constant speed left to right over to that 2 meters, which makes this a lot easier. So the second distance is 1.75 meters. Um, let's go ahead and move down to the area where we actually have to write this stuff. So let's move it on down to here and we're calculating that time. So we said the first distance that it travels is 0.25 meters. And we said that that was from the uh, compressed to the uncompressed uh, area. So D2 is equal to 2 minus that 0.25. And this is the area where it's just freely floating. And it's going at constant speed. So that's 1.75 meters. Now what we can do is let's, and we said that this is at 0.79 seconds. Okay. So our second time should be equal to the second distance divided by the velocity. Well, we know that second distance is 1.75 meters, and we found that velocity to be 0.5 meters per second. And so it travels in the second part about 3.5 seconds. So let's go ahead and add for our total time should be equal to the first time plus the second time. So that's 0.79 seconds plus 3.5 seconds, and that gives us 4.29 seconds total time of, uh, of travel. 
and that makes it a lot easier to do than trying to do the approximation of the squares. All right, so now that we've done that, we want to find the force constant of the spring. So to find the force constant of the spring, we uh, still have not used any calculus in this per se, other than just maybe in that one explanation of just showing the, uh, the integral, making sure that we understand that the velocity time graph can give us the position uh, change by doing the integral. So to calculate the force constant of the spring, we know that when we squeeze that spring, it's going to have some potential energy. And all of that potential energy uh, should be converted into kinetic energy. So this is the potential energy of the spring at position one and the kinetic energy afterwards, which would be, we'll call it position two. Potential energy for a spring is one half K X squared. The poten the, uh, so that's potential. The uh, kinetic energy is one half M V squared. Let's go ahead and solve this for K. So K is equal to MV squared over X squared. So I've just taken this, got rid of the one halves. Now I've got K is equal to MV squared over K X squared. So we had to divide both sides by X squared. Uh, we're going to plug all our numbers in. So this is 0.4 kilograms times 0.5 meters per second. Need to square that divided by 0.25 meters squared. So this was the, um, this is that, uh, that compression that we had. Uh, this is that final speed that we had. And then this is the mass. So now our spring constant is 1.6 and then it's measured in newtons per meter. And that is the end of this question.